Grace, we have a breaking update in the ongoing St. Augustine's University financial crisis saga. The school announced a significant reduction in staff, detailing plans to cut a number of university employees in half. WRL's Carly Haynes joins us live from outside of campus. Now, Carly, who will be impacted by these latest cuts? <laughs> Julian, the interim president had previously told us that he did expect some cuts would be coming to staff and to programs. Today, we're learning just how many people this affects. An email hit the inbox of the St. Augustine's community Saturday. The university cutting its number of employees in half. The chair of the board's finance committee wrote, while we recognize the seriousness of these financial adjustments, these decisions are essential for safeguarding the future of St. Augustine's university and the students we serve. Breaking down the numbers, St. Augustine's is slashing 67 staff positions, 37 full-time faculty, and 32 adjunct faculty. SAU is also discontinuing several programs and working to settle debt with vendors. The university says it's part of an overall strategy that included cutting expenses by roughly $17 million this year. The university's chief operating officer wrote, the steps we take today symbolize our dedication to a financially secure future, a move that the university says shows its commitment to financial stability. And this is the latest news to come out of the university ahead of the accrediting board making its decision next month. Carly Haynes, WRL News, live in Raleigh. We also received a statement today from St. Augustine's regarding a fundraising event by a former track coach at the university and an alumni group. The race to save SAU last night, days after the school took out a $7 million loan, which alarmed some alumni who are worried it will be a burden on the school's future. That's the benefit dinner celebrated lost. former coach George Williams. Now, he built a powerhouse track and field program at SAU. Now, several benefit attendees who spoke last night criticized university leaders for agreeing to the terms of the loan. In an email sent today to WRL News, a university representative responded to remarks made at the event. It reads in part, quote, while we appreciate alumni efforts to support us, we have yet to receive any verified donations from Save SAU Coalition. We also understand the community's concerns regarding the Gothic Ventures loan, but the university faced limited options to address our financial difficulties, particularly due to the coalition's actions undermining alumni contributions. Troopers are investigating a deadly crash that closed down a portion of NC 87 in Harnett County this afternoon. Our breaking news tracker got this video that you're looking at right here of the scene. Now you can see a badly damaged car in the ditch on the side of the road, as well as a tractor trailer with major damage to the front of the truck. Troopers say the car crossed the center line into the truck's path. One person is dead. We're still working to know more about what caused that crash. And happening right now in the WRL Live Center, the suspect vehicle of an Asheboro homicide was found in Durham last night. Here's that vehicle right here. It's a gray 2013 Toyota Avalon. That vehicle was found abandoned. Those two male suspects are still at large. I'll give you a closer look at them as well. Not the best picture, but just to give you a sense here. Asheboro police say a veteran was killed about two weeks ago during an armed robbery on Veterans Day. As of now, we have no specific description of these two men. The investigation is ongoing, and we're also trying to find out more from Durham Police. That investigation will continue. Thank you, Megan. Well, we have more cold weather on the way with frost possible for part of our viewing area overnight. Meteorologist Anthony Baglione joins us now in the WRL Severe Weather Center. And Anthony, what areas are under a frost advisory? Julian, at this point from the National Weather Service, it's mainly areas south and east of the triangle currently. I will caution, though, everyone sees the potential for frost tonight. This is just where the growing season has technically not ended yet. So that's kind of why the official frost advisory is for those areas. Areas. Temperatures as low as about 34 degrees for us tonight. That's going to lead to patchy frost across most of the area early tomorrow morning. Where we sit right now, though, you step outside, it's definitely a little bit chilly. We're in the 40s there in Clinton, 52 in Roxborough, in the mid 50s around.
around the triangle Durham and Raleigh. You see right there with those temperatures cooling off pretty fast for us tonight. Right around 36 South Hill, 34 in Lewisburg, waking up on your Sunday morning, 35 in Irwin, 36 there in Smithfield. It will be dry for us tonight, though, Julian, but we do have a much bigger weather system on the way that could affect Thanksgiving travel. We're going to talk about when that gets here coming up. Oh, we'll be all ears for that one. Thank you, Anthony. A man suffered second degree burns after a fire in an abandoned house in Raleigh. There it is there. The fire department responded to the fire this morning. A man inside the home was taken to Wake Med with critical injuries. Firefighters are still working to determine the cause of that fire that you see right there. Well, it has been nearly two months since Helene devastated and caused a lot of devastation and flooding and mudslides in western North Carolina. For some people, the goal right now is just to rebuild. Others are mourning the loss of loved ones. More than 100 people were killed in our state. Let that sink in, 100 people. Then there are people like the Ashby family who still don't have answers. Kim Ashby, Ashby was a Lee County middle school teacher. She was last seen floating down the river after floodwaters carried her away from her Avery County home. Her husband was found alive days later, two miles away. Kim Ashby has still not been found. Today, her family is holding a celebration of life as a way of normalizing their grieving process. Mom was full of life and she impacted so many in her community as a teacher, in multiple communities as a teacher, she moved frequently. And so I think a part of it was for us as a family, but I think a part of it was also for her community and her students and for people to be able to kind of have that moment to say goodbye and to, to celebrate her with loved ones. The Ashby's did share that they kept today's celebration small and centered around family and loved ones. They say is something their mother would have wanted. Many families in Western North Carolina are still living in tents after Helene, but help is on the way. That's what we're told. State lawmakers called on FEMA to waive some regulations to allow trailers to be placed on flooded areas while the community continues efforts to rebuild. They requested 1,080 trailers to meet the basic needs of residents in Western North Carolina. FEMA trailers are now being distributed in 27 affected counties. Because I applied for the disaster relief for my home, they contacted me. We'll be able to build back uh, better. God will spare us this happening over again, maybe for another hundred years at least. Yeah, hundred years. Current FEMA regulations do not allow temporary housing to be deployed to flood prone areas. North Carolina lawmakers are asking for FEMA to waive some regulations, allowing people to stay on their property while repairs are made. That would allow them to stay close to loved ones, attend school and continue working. In Raleigh, the 80th annual Christmas parade was a celebration unlike none other today. The parade welcomed back motorized vehicles for the first time in more than two years. More than 100 cars, trucks, antique tractors all took to the city streets today. It was a lot of fun. That said, though, WRL's Eric Miller was there and he has the story. Beat the drums and blow the horns, it's Christmas time in Raleigh. Leading the charge at the 80th annual Christmas parade, there were of course the marching bands, horseback riders, and furry friends of all sizes. But for the first time in two years, there was also the rumble of engines along Fayetteville Street. I think it'll be exciting. Hilary Atanas and Callie Emmett, just two of the tens of thousands who braved brisk winds to catch a view, waiting more than an hour to grab a spot. A little chilly. A little chilly. <laughs> but yeah. we We've got coffee, so it's fine. Among the changes that brought vehicles back to the parade this year, drivers had to be at least 25 years old, and all vehicles had to be inspected. Updates that parade goers like Tammy Norris approve of. Yeah, yeah, I believe so. Norris says she's been coming to the parade her entire life, an annual event that's very near and dear. Started the holiday season. Uh, I lost my mom 12 years ago. She loved the she loved the holiday season. She always made it super special for her whole family. Among the marchers Saturday was at least one group directly impacted by Hurricane Helene. Henderson Collegiate High School sounding off as people like Danielle Lowry offered a helping hand on the sideline. Today we um, set up hot chocolate. We're getting donations actually, so whatever you want to donate. Lowry selling cups of cocoa to raise hurricane relief funds. It's a lot. They've been lining up. As this parade raises holiday hopes and spirits higher than the North Pole. Hello, Santa, and this is Claus. 
In Raleigh, Eric Miller, WRAL News. Ah, uh, wasn't it just great just seeing everyone out there? Now, during our parade coverage, WRL's Ken Smith talked with the Carolina Hurricanes president, Doug Wharf, about the team's games coming up on WRL and Fox 50 next week. Our team is playing so well, you know, and that's what's exciting about it is we get to have our team on your broadcast. And this is the first time that I can think of that we've ever gone over the air. We're typically on a cable station or streaming. So to bring it over the air to, to the masses and the triangle is going to be very exciting for our team right now. Oh, we are so excited. Remember, the Hurricanes will take on the Dallas Stars Monday at 7 on Fox 50. And on Black Friday, they host the Florida Panthers at 3 on WRL. Don't miss hockey for the holidays next week on WRL and Fox 50. All right, we still have so much more to talk about. Caregivers and or caregiving is a job that often goes without recognition or thanks. This month, caregivers across the country are being celebrated for all the work they do. Coming up, one caregiver shares how their work provides vital support to families. Welcome back. WRL has confirmed that Duke Health is expanding its medical campus in West Cary. The campus on Green Level West Road opening in 2022 with primary care pediatric, urgent care and specialty services. Duke says the next project is an 111,000 square foot hospital That's set to open by 2027. Plans are to have 40 beds and advanced medical equipment, including operating rooms and cancer treatment tools. Duke says it's the project that will be used for mixed use on campus with health care, retail and hotels. Throughout this month, caregivers across the country are being celebrated in honor of National Caregivers Month. Listen to this number right now. There are more than 1.3 million people in North Carolina taking care of a loved one. Many of them are juggling full time jobs, family responsibilities and caregiving around the clock. That's where the Tammy Lynn Center in Raleigh comes in. They offer vital support to families caring for children and adults with special needs. Now, over the years, the center has provided everything from residential care to therapeutic programs, care management and day services. You know, I think one of the things that's really important to understand is that when you are a parent or an aunt or uncle or a grandparent who's taking care of a child with disabilities, that job is incredibly challenging, um, and it's a job that never ends. It's 24 hours a day. Let's talk about the demand. The demand for services at the Tammy Lynn Center right now is very clear. There's a waiting list for 18,000 people right now, 18,000 people on that waiting list. The Raleigh Christmas Parade wasn't the only big event downtown today. There was also the American Indian Heritage Celebration at the North Carolina Museum of Natural, Natural Sciences. It was a free family event. It was friendly for everyone. The event showcasing the culture and traditions of the state's eight recognized tribes. Uh, we want to see that under, individuals understand that, that we've contributed a lot to the, the state and to uh, the country as we celebrate our 250th anniversary in 2026. The event featured drum circles, traditional dances, and interactive demonstrations of pottery, basket weaving, and storytelling. A coat can mean so much, we know, right? Hope, warmth, and of course, kindness. Well, that's why a donation to the WRL Coats for the Children could make all the difference for families in need this winter. For a list of neighborhood Jiffy Lube drop-off locations or to make an online donation, visit WRL.com slash coats. All the information is right there for you. Anthony, it will be a chilly night tonight. Very cold. Yeah, very cold temperatures, Julian. We have frost advisories out. I feel like we've kind of done this pattern where we see the cold temperatures filter back in. We get a little brief warm up and then back down. I got to say that looking ahead to Thanksgiving, which we will talk about shortly, it looks like some definitely colder weather consistently is headed this way. Here's where we sit though right now. So the National Weather Service has issued frost advisories for our eastern counties. A large chunk of eastern North Carolina, including Wilmington, it does not include Raleigh. It includes Fayetteville, but I will caution with that said, everyone has that potential to see some frost. It's just those areas in the triangle to the west where we have not seen our growing season or we have seen our growing season rather and and then those areas that are outlined in that frost advisory have technically not. And so it's just to spread the word if you have plants out and things that could be affected by that cold. Just 
Just make sure to prepare that for that tonight. Otherwise, there's where the growing season has officially ended as of a couple days ago from Wake County all the way back to the west. Our temperatures at the moment, you step outside. It's that kind of cool, refreshing, crisp air that we have in place. 55 currently in Durham and Raleigh, 50 in Roxboro. We're sitting at 47 there in Southern Pines, 49 in Clinton. So we have the chill out there. And now that the sun is down, we are going to have some clear skies and temperatures will fall off pretty fast for us tonight. Mid 30s for the majority of us to the north, even a few low 30s west of our viewing area could be possible. Even Siler City there checking in at 33. We get closer to, let's say, Fayetteville at 36, 36 also in Goldsboro, mainly in the low 30s there in Robbins, also Sanford. So it's going to be a cold start if you're headed out to church tomorrow morning or just taking the dogs out, getting your steps in. You're going to want to have the coat handy. But with that said, it will start cold. It's going to be a beautiful day. We have sunshine at 65. It will be warmer during the afternoon than today. Totally dry. Travel's looking good. 52 there at 7 o'clock tomorrow evening. Let's talk about travel. The all-important forecast as we head through our Thanksgiving week, right? Here's looking ahead. So Sunday, we're great. Monday's looking good. Tuesday, I went ahead and left this in the green because we could see a stray shower. It is basically going to be sprinkles at most, so it's not going to affect travel. Wednesday's looking great. Thursday, though, just in time for Thanksgiving, it is going to be a good day to to be inside, maybe taking that post turkey nap, watching some football. This is what's headed this way. So Wednesday, definitely the better travel day for us. All of this rainfall likely starting, I would say, as early as about 9 to 10 a.m. Thanksgiving morning, lasting off and on through the day. There's going to be a front nearby. It could bring some snow up toward Michigan, Chicago, going to be pretty messy up there. Potential for some flight delays if you're headed in that direction. Clearing out, though, by Black Friday. Black Friday at this point looks totally dry. It could start to last linger a little bit into Thursday night, but Friday looking pretty good. 69 for us there on Monday, 67 by the time we get to Tuesday. Again, this is going to be about sprinkles at best. It's not going to be a lot of rain coming through. 60s there Wednesday, Thursday, and Julian, we look ahead to next weekend, 45 degrees on Saturday. So it is going to be much colder consistently headed this way. That's a four and a five together, right? <laughs> yes. I don't no want 80s. no parts of it. Yeah. All right, thanks, Anthony. Lewis is with us. Lewis, let's talk UNC football. Yeah, Julian, UNC had won three games in a row, trying to make it four, but Boston college had other plans. What went wrong in Chestnut Hill for the Tar Heels? Coming up in sports. The Tar Heels are bowl eligible, winning three straight games, just two left in the regular season. Saturday, they go on the road to face five-win Boston College. The Eagles had a lead in the second quarter, and they kept a lead in the second quarter. Jonathan Montague Jr., the end around for 24 yards, his first career touchdown. He's a local kid, a freshman quarterback. He played high school ball at Clayton. Eagles up 17-0. Offense and defense need some help for Carolina. Special teams to the rescue. Chris Culver takes this one. 95 yards. Ring, ring. House call. Heels score. 17-7 now. Quarterback Jacoby Criswell in the offense had a hard time all day. He had three turnovers, including this interception. Ryan Turner goes the distance for the score. Davion Goss scores two touchdowns in the final two minutes, but this one was not as close as the score indicates. UNC loses at Boston College 41-21. Heels will host 5-6 NC State next Saturday for the final game of the regular season. Mmm. I'm a couple of cups of coffee deep today because, viewer, I care about you. I stayed up and watched both late-night basketball games last night, and the heels didn't even start until 12.35 a.m. We, however, are going to start with number 12, Duke, beating number 18, Arizona, on the road, 69-55. to Some notes. When in doubt, Duke is already leaning in on its freshman. Cooper Flagg led the way with 24 points. He also had 11 shot attempts in the second half. Plus, Khan Knipple is going to hit a lot of dagger threes this season. He was 3 of 4 from deep in the final half, 11 points in the final 20 minutes alone. And Duke's defense dominates. They have the top defensive rating on Ken Palm right now, top 25 in both 3-point and 2-point field goal percentage. Next game is Tuesday against number one, Kansas. Now, let's head to Honolulu. UNC beat Hawaii 87 to 69. They play in the Maui Invitational next week, getting a chance to acclimate a little early. Now, stop me if you've heard this already, but UNC's backcourt might be the best group in the country. Elliot Cadeau had 17 points in 23 minutes. His takes were strong, showing his growth. UNC scored 87 points, even though they didn't score in the first two and a half minutes of the game. Hawaii made this tight. UNC led by just five early in the second half, but went on a 19-4 run to pull away. Next game is Monday against Dayton. 
The MEAC announced earlier this week 19 NC Central players and one assistant coach would be suspended after a large fight between the Eagles and Howard last week. Saturday, NC Central plays its final game of the regular season on the road against Delaware State. Central without starting quarterback Walker Harris. Fayetteville native redshirt freshman Joshua Jones gets the start. He's moving early on. Six yards, seven nothing Eagles around the corner in the first quarter. Hey, want to lift me up? Very nice. Want to see me do it again? Jones, two yards this time. The other end of the end zone, 14 nothing Eagles. Lift them up again. Let's celebrate. Let's have some fun. And then the defense gets involved. Redshirt freshman Eric Adams gets the interception, and he goes all the way. NC Central in control the entire time. The Eagles beat Delaware State 52 to 10. They end the regular season 8 to 3, 8 and 3, 4 and 1 in MIAC play. Fighting Camels hosting the Towson Tigers on Senior Day, trailing 21-9 in the third quarter. If we're showing you a punt, either something really good or really bad happened. Redshirt senior Jalen Brooks from Cardinal Gibbons recovers the ball to mark him just shy of the goal line. Mark Biggins comes in to finish it up. 21-16 on the short score, but Tigers outscored the Camels 24-7 in the fourth quarter. Towson goes on to win 45-23. Next week, we have some hockey for the holidays on WRAL and Fox 50. Watch the Canes take on the Dallas Stars Monday at 7 on Fox 50. And on Black Friday, the Canes host the Florida Panthers. You can watch that one on WRAL at 3 o'clock. Important to note, these are free over the air. A nice opportunity, a cool gift for Canes fans for Thanksgiving. By the way, they play uh, the Blue Jackets coming up later tonight. We'll have that highlight for you uh, on the uh, night shows, Julian. All right, we'll be watching. Wow, NC Central didn't miss a beat. Did not. Thanks, Lewis. Well, thanks for joining us tonight. We'll see you later. Have a good night. Be safe.